Goedenavond, beste kijkers. Ik heet u namens het Nationaal Instituut Nederlands Slavernijverleden en Erfenis, het Ninzij en Pakhuis De Zwijger, welkom op de Kitty Kotti lezing. Mijn naam is Brit-Marie van der Drift. Ik ben werkzaam voor het Ninzij als coördinator educatie. En vanavond ben ik uw moderator. De Kitty Kotti lezing vindt plaats in de maand juni, de Kitty Kotti maand. Een maand die in het teken staat van herdenken en bezinnen rondom het slavernijverleden van Nederland en de doorwerkingen ervan vandaag de dag. Vanavond krijgen wij meer informatie over het slavernijverleden en dan in het bijzonder over reparations. Daarover zal zometeen de heer Erwin Vient, directeur van het NINSEE, meer vertellen. We gaan straks kijken naar een opgenomen lezing van professor Sir Hilary Beckles. Hij heeft speciaal voor ons uh, deze lezing opgenomen en de lezing duurt ongeveer 40 minuten. Aansluitend hebben wij een Q&A van ongeveer 10 minuten. Ik nodig daarom ook alle kijkers van harte uit om vragen te stellen um, in Zoom. Dat kan via de programmapagina van de website van Pakhuis De Zwijger... of via een comment in de livestream van de Facebook van het Ninsee. Voordat wij gaan kijken naar de lezing van professor Beckels... wil ik graag eerst het woord geven aan Erwin Vient. Ja, dankjewel, uh, mevrouw... Britt-Marie, uh, zoals je al eerder uh, aangekondigd hebt, is dit, uh, deze lezing uh, gaat over het onderwerp Reparation. Een Kitty Kotti lezing die we jaarlijks inderdaad hebben. En uh, voor het onderwerp uh, Kitty Kotti of uh, Reparation hebben wij gekozen omdat wij, uh, Ninsi, de focus ook aandacht willen vragen voor uh, de doorwerking van het verleden. Uh, zo langzamerhand zien wij een uh, goede aandacht ook uh, ontstaan voor uh, dat wat zich heeft plaatsgevonden in de periode van de sla transatlantische slavernij. En wij vinden het nodig om ook de focus vooral te leggen op de doorwerking en met name hoe, hoe dat aan te pakken, de achterstellingen en achterstanden die zijn ontstaan. En daarover uh, hebben wij... Uh, de heer professor Sir Hilary Beckles gevraagd om zijn uh, licht hierover uh, te laten schijnen. De heer uh, professor Sir Hilary Beckles is de achtste uh, vice-chancellor van de University of the West Indies en is een vooraanstaande academicus. Sir Hilary Beckles heeft uh, wereldwijde erkenning gekregen voor zijn uh, academische prestaties en uh, heeft uh, lezingen verzorgd in Europa. Amerika, Afrika, Azië en heeft meer dan 100 peer-reviewed essays uh, gepubliceerd in wetenschappelijke tijdschriften en meer dan 13 uh, boeken over onderwerpen variëren van de Atlantische en Caribische geschiedenis, over uh, genderverhoudingen in het Caribisch gebied, sportontwikkeling en populaire cultuur. In 2013 werd hij uh, gevraagd door de regeringsleiders van de Caribische uh, gemeenschap uh, CARICOM om de inaugurele voorzitter te zijn van de CARICOM Reparation Commission. Dit orgaan coördineert de beleidsstandpunten van de Caribische regeringen met betrekking tot wereldwijde herstelbetalingen voor inheemse genocide, Afrikaanse slavernij en kolonialisme. Onder zijn leiding werd het Center for Reparations Research van de University of the West Indies opgericht om de implementatie van CARICOM's Reparation Justice Program te leiden. Hij ontving talloze eredoctoraten van over de hele wereld en ontving onlangs de Martin Luther King Jr. Peace and Freedom Award. We gaan nu kijken naar een opname van Sir Hilary Beckles. Het is een tremendous honor and privilege to present this 2021 Keti Koti lecture on behalf of the National Institute for the Study of Dutch Slavery. I wish to commend the leadership and membership of the National Institute for a very persistent and high quality 
series of programs dedicating to highlighting the history and legacies of the enslavement of African peoples by citizens of the Dutch nation. I wish to recognize specifically also Mr. Gordon Cronin, who is the event uh, producer. For many years, during the 1990s, I had the privilege to be a member of the Prince Klaus Fund Committee that participated in many conversations about the Dutch in the modern world, the Dutch nation in the era of colonialism and imperial expansion. During those years, the conversations were very pertinent and very relevant to the issues that are contained here in the content of this, of this lecture. The Prince Claus Fund was a remarkable forum for interrogating the history uh, and the legacy of this historic process, uh, urging uh, the Dutch nation to come to a better understanding within this 21st century of the harm created by its colonial enterprise. Indeed, in 2001, the fund was responsible for the publication of a very important book entitled Facing Up to the Past. It was edited by Hurt Ostendi, distinguished Dutch scholar and great advocate of progressive causes. It was a book that called upon all of us on both sides of the Atlantic, the descendants of the enslavers as well as the descendant of the enslaved, to enter a period of reflection, a period of reflection in as honest as it is humanly possible to achieve. There is no doubt that the Dutch had a very central role to play in the global expansion of the chattel enslavement of African peoples. And if we assume, as we have been asked to do by the international community, by the scholastic community, by jurists and all those in the, in the area of the legality of the imperial process, that this was indeed a crime against humanity. Not only the genocide against the indigenous peoples in those places where the Dutch colonized, and I will discuss this later, but also structuring and organizing the global expansion of the chattel enslavement of African peoples. Reactions in this conversation can be classified as African reactions, Caribbean reactions, European and Asian and American reactions. We were operating within the context of the United Nations strategy, breaking the silence around this crime against humanity. We also participated in the two projects that emerge out of the Dutch history, but principally out of the United Nations mandate. I refer to the Slave Roots Project that was created, designed to achieve two principal objectives, breaking the silence around the crimes against humanity, but to do so within the context of two projects, to, to promote the study 
of colonization, slavery, and imperialism within the system of school education, but also for professors, experts, researchers to bring to light for public discussion the history long hidden, long buried within the archives uh, of the Western world about the nature of this crime against humanity. I'm honored to have been a part of all of these processes. The UNESCO Slave Roots Project, the Prince Klaus Fund Research and Advocacy, and also within the academic community of being a part of this journey to the discovery and the advocacy around truth. We know that much of the history has been described in various ways, especially that history emanating from European scholarship. We have heard descriptions such as dishonest. We have heard about unprofessional. We have heard about unscientific. And all of these narratives uh, have been used to describe what for many centuries was classified as the history of slavery and the role of Europe, and specifically the role of the Dutch in promoting, expanding, and developing this slavery enterprise. But we all understood the reasons for this. History has long been a critical part of nation building. The historical narrative lies at the center of what is considered to be the national identity. The national identity is built around what is known, uh, what is celebrated, what is uh, the core of education and legacy and culture. And if the history of slavery has been buried beneath these discourses, then clearly what we have is an unscientific, unacceptable approach to the construction of what is accurately nationalism and national identity. Let me begin, therefore, with a critical point of intellectual departure. All of the nations of Western Europe in the 16th and 17th centuries define slavery and colonization to be in the national interest. While there was indeed a conversation about the legality of enslaving the Africans, while there was a discourse about the legitimacy of appropriating the resources of indigenous peoples and subjecting those indigenous peoples to the beginning of a cascading of genocide, while in each of these countries, in the Dutch nation, the, the British, the French, the, the Spanish, the Portuguese, there were conversations about the criminality of this activity, the unchristian nature of these activities, therefore the immorality of this colonial enterprise. It was understood that this, in an age of European competitiveness, this project of enslavement was considered to be in the national interest. And therefore, the enslavement of Africans throughout the Dutch nation, throughout the Dutch community, the enslavement of the African peoples was considered to be in the national interest and therefore endorsed by all of the major institutions within that nation, the state, the church, the economic leadership, the university and scholastic community, there was a convergence around all of this within the Dutch community that this process was going to be enriching of the Dutch economy, is going to be elevating of Dutch society, and it was going to be prestigious for the Dutch people entering into this phase 
of modernity. And therefore, there was not only convergence and consensus, there was a commitment within Dutch consciousness to pursue African slave trading, African slavery, colonization, and all of the consequences that followed from this. And so the educational system, the religious paradigms, found expressions in all of the major institutions within the Dutch community. The universities received the endowments from slave traders and slave owners. The state received the revenues from taxation, from ownership, from trade and finance. And so the treasury of the state were replenished with revenues from the slavery enterprise. The school system developed a pedagogy where children were educated and socialized into believing that all of this Dutch expansion was ethical, moral, and consistent with the emergence of the Dutch nation. The art, which we find in all of the major museums in Amsterdam and other, and other cities, the art, the classical art of the great painters of the nation reflected the extent to which Dutch consciousness was deeply embracing of slavery and slave trading. And the imagination of the artists emerged out of this comprehension that slavery was necessary for the Dutch people to distinguish themselves uh, in the world. As a result of this, the, the monument approach to celebration took effect within this context. The slavers, the enrichers from slavery, those who had committed these crimes against humanity were celebrated as great citizens. There were monuments, there were statues, there were all kinds of national empowerment around the lives and the times of these slave traders uh, and these investors uh, in the crime against humanity. Dutch capitalism was therefore built in its external context, the international trade, the international expansion of investment opportunities. Dutch capitalism built around the finance center of Amsterdam was built upon the globalization of the enslavement of African peoples. In other words, you could not separate the expansion of the Dutch economy, the Dutch society, from the engagement in slavery and in slave trading. This is the legacy which we are addressing today. This toxic legacy, finding expression in white supremacy racism that followed logically from the legitimization of the relationship between slavery, colonization, and the national interest. We are at this moment in history speaking about the post-colony. In those places that have suffered the crimes against humanity and the New World in the Caribbean and Brazil and uh, the Americas on the whole, citizens of the emerging post-colonial nations are still dealing centrally with the legacy of the post-colony, primarily the racism that continues to be embedded in the post-colony. But even in the Dutch nation itself, the post-colonial discourse still reflects a deep attachment to the colonial legacy. Dutch society and its imagination still continue to feel an affinity to be associated with what has been described as a golden age of the Dutch nation, an age of imperialism, an age of slavery, an age of colonization, an age of genocide. All of that is still being celebrated as a critical part of the making of the Dutch nation. And the Dutch people are having great difficulty in detaching themselves from this scaffold. How do we encourage the Dutch community to begin the process of critical engagement 
and distancing itself from what is now being called the legacies of crimes against humanity. The 21st century is becoming very intolerant of the celebration of this legacy. The younger generations are calling for an ethical world. They reflect upon the history of their nation. They reflect upon the meaning of being citizens in the 21st century. And they are finding this attachment to this legacy extremely problematic. They are finding it to be immoral and they are wishing for a path through which they can distance themselves uh, from, this, from this tradition. Because they recognize that the primary legacy is the endurance of a white supremacy consciousness that is leading to all kinds of racial tensions and problems in the world at the beginning of this 21st century. But let me give you a perspective from the post colony, from the Caribbean, where the Dutch continue to hold on to societies in a colonial relationship. The islands of Curacao and Aruba, and all of these places where the crime against humanity was committed in the context of slavery, they continue to be Dutch colonies. We can articulate that structure of constitution in as many sophisticated ways as possible. But the fact remains, there are Dutch colonies. They take direction and authority from the Dutch parliament. And the people in those societies still feel themselves to be colonized. So the Caribbean remains one of the few places in the world where there are still colonies. People trapped in the history of colonization and imperialism and are seeking to escape from this colonial world. Dutch remain one of the most significant nations in the 21st century that continues to invest in the politics of colonization. And this from a Caribbean perspective is unacceptable. This from a Caribbean perspective is a subject for resistance and the Caribbean continues to resist Dutch colonial domination. The importance of a Caribbean perspective is important. In the Caribbean, it took some three to 400 years by the African peoples to fight against slavery. It was one of the most brutal struggles in the history of the world to uproot slavery from the world and allow freedom to reign. This is the magnificent contribution of the African peoples to 21st century global civilization. Their heroic struggle to uproot slavery, to allow freedom to reign, to allow democracy to emerge in a real and concrete fashion. And in that struggle to end oppression and human misery, the struggle was focused also upon the Dutch nation and what it had done in the Americas. So eventually slavery was abolished and banished from the modern world. That is the legacy of the African people to rid the modern world of slavery through persistent endemic rebellion and resistance. But after slavery was abolished uh, in the 19th century, it took another 100 years to convert those legal rights of the Africans into human rights and civil rights, because the imperial powers, having been forced to relinquish control of slavery and ownership and the power to implement, responded by restricting the freedom of those African peoples by imposing upon them white supremacy apartheid. The Dutch was the quintessential nation that saw to it that racialized white supremacy apartheid was implemented in the Caribbean colonies as well as in Africa. And so it becomes impossible to separate the Dutch imagination and the Dutch state and Dutch citizens from the 
20th century apartheid systems that emerged from the ashes of, of slavery. But as we continue to break the silence and push through to eradicate the legacies of slavery, to allow human rights and civil rights to thrive, we are now entering the third phase of this struggle. And the third phase of this struggle is the search for reparatory justice, that those who committed these crimes must come to the table and assist in the process of restitution, assist in the process of reparatory justice as evidence and proof of the acceptance of responsibility for the horrors of slavery and the consequences of the crimes that were imposed upon the indigenous and African peoples in these Dutch and other European colonies. What we have seen has been a stone-faced reaction. While philosophy and jurisprudence and ethics all point to the legitimacy of your repartory justice approach within the nations of Europe, there continues to be a refusal to accept ownership and responsibility for this legacy. The Dutch is just one of many nations responsible for resisting the narrative of repartory justice and restitution as the beginning of a moral and ethical journey into identity in this 21st century. And so what we have seen is a stone-faced reaction, a chilling, a chilling reaction that says, no, we are not going to accept responsibility for these consequences. At best, we will issue a statement of regret. The statement of regret is a racist reaction to the politics of reparatory justice. Because what does the regret says? It says we regret, we regret what had happened, but we do not apologize for it. We do not apologize. The apology is an admission of responsibility. The statement of regret is not an admission of responsibility. It's a recognition of history. And it says, having recognized that history, let us, let us move along. Let us move along. Let us not litigate and discuss the issues of history. We accept the history, so let's, let's move on. This is a racial reaction, and indeed a racist reaction. So the consequences have been that universities, for example, would research their own histories and show the extent to which they have been drinking from the well of slavery and which endowments and funded professorships, the infrastructure of universities, the paying of salaries of professors, all of that experience in the university was supported by the profits that came from the crime of slavery, slave trading, and indigenous genocide. But the tendency has been for universities to research their history. And in the face of the compelling evidence of that association, that commitment to slavery, universities would research and run away. They would research, collect the evidence, turn their backs and walk away. And so what is emerging is this politics for universities to research and run, which strikes at the very heart of what is an excellent university. Because an excellent university must be an ethical university. And a university cannot be ethical if having reduced itself to a supporter of slavery, to be the beneficiary of slavery. It seeks to ignore and to suppress that history and to walk away. We say no. A university cannot be excellent if it, is, if it is unethical. And it is unethical to research and run. It is, it is ethical, on the other hand, to research and restitute, to research and confront and deal with the consequences 
of that history. And so we have a younger generation of students who are describing their histories and their national narratives as, as lies, as deceptions, as the discovery, the discovery of new history is exposing the immorality and the dishonesty of traditional histories. The truth of the matter is, there had always been an opposition to slavery in Western Europe, but that opposition was brushed aside by the national convergence and description of the national interest. The national interest set aside all opposition. And therefore, at the emerging moment of slavery in the Dutch nation, those who opposed slavery were set aside as subversive of the national, of the national interest. And how easily that was done by the state and all of its empowering institutions. Let me look now specifically at the Dutch nation and the history of slavery. It is undoubtedly true that the Dutch were the first European nation to globalize the chattel enslavement of Africans. The Dutch found their place in the emerging colonial world. The Dutch found their niche as a small nation surrounded by more powerful nations, the Spanish and the Portuguese, the French and, and the British. What the Dutch was able to do was to use their commercial expertise, to use their expertise in shipping and navigation and commerce, to use their expertise in financial management, Amsterdam being the center of the financial world, of the financial Western world, to use those important assets and to develop the operationalization of slave trading and slavery. And so the Dutch were the ones who were able to say to all of the other competing European nations, we will supply you with the African slaves you need. And so the Dutch became the principal supplier of enslaved Africans to the Portuguese in Brazil. They became the principal suppliers of enslaved Africans to the English in the Caribbean and to the French in the Caribbean. Whoever wanted enslaved Africans to build a colonial enterprise, the Dutch were there to provide them not only with the enslaved Africans, but with the finance to enable them to afford to purchase and to deploy those enslaved Africans. There would have been no globalization of slavery had not the Dutch expertise come to the table at the critical moment. And I'm speaking about the end of the 16th century and the beginning of the 17th century when chattel slavery became a norm in the northeastern part of the Brazil, which was a Portuguese colony. Brazil developed the plantation system. Brazil developed the slave-based economy. Africans supplied primarily by the Dutch. Portuguese obtaining Dutch finance to purchase these Africans to build their plantations. And the Dutch were the beneficiaries of two streams of profitability. The stream of profits from selling the enslaved Africans and the, the stream of profits from providing the finance to enable chattel slavery to become the basis of the expansion of the Americas. The Dutch, of course, made an important bid to take over Brazil. They wanted to integrate the entire enterprise. They wanted not only to supply the enslaved Africans through the Dutch West Indian Company and other enterprises, but they also wanted to get involved in the production of sugar in a Dutch colony. So they would have three revenue streams, the finance, the slave trading, and the sugar production. They did not succeed, however, in taking military control of Brazil as a result of an effective Portuguese resistance. But leaving Brazil, 
where they had been defeated in battle, they moved to the Caribbean. They brought their capital, they brought their slave trading connections, the Dutch West Indian Company, uh, slave trading company, they brought that entire apparatus of Dutch commerce and Dutch finance to the Caribbean. And in the Caribbean, they found the English and they found the French, and they became the partners of the Dutch, of the French and the English in building out their colonial enterprise. Barbados became the first main African-based slave society in the region. But it was not possible without Dutch support. It was an English colony, but the English relied upon the Dutch slave traders to provide them with enslaved Africans, to provide them with the finance. And thus Barbados emerged as an English sugar plantation colony financed by the Dutch and provided with the capital by the Dutch. And of course, the Dutch also supplied them with the technology to build the sugar mill. So African enslavement spread across the Caribbean in the 17th century, creating the richest economic ecosystem in the whole of the Americas for those investors in slavery. And at the heart of that financial achievement was Dutch finance and Dutch slave traders. The Dutch were the quintessential organizers, structurers of the African enslavement process. But they also went to West Africa to the source of the slave trading and establish commercial posts, enabling them to control the supply of enslaved Africans to the Americas. And they committed massacres in West Africa as the Africans resisted the Dutch presence, the Dutch militarized their presence and defeated and slaughtered Africans who stood in the way of their slave trading enterprise. And so from West Africa to Brazil, to the Caribbean, to North America, the Dutch were at the center of all of these important crimes against humanity. But it did not end there. The Dutch are also responsible for taking African enslavement into Asia. Southeast Asia, where the Dutch had built up through the East Indian Company, trading posts, commercial centers. The relationship between the West Indian Company, the Dutch West Indian Company and the Dutch East Indian Company allowed African enslavement to journey into Southeast Asia. And so Dutch politics, Dutch economics, Dutch finance took African enslavement throughout Southeast Asia, moving African enslavement away from the new world, from the Americas as its only market, to add to that market, the Asian market. No other nation has succeeded in taking African enslavement into Asia the way the African did. And so the Dutch operated on both sides of the market, the new world market, the Asian the Asian market. In that regard, we consider the Dutch to be the dominant globalizers of African slavery and the philosophy of white supremacy that accompanied, that accompanied that process. The history of these two companies, the Dutch East India Company and then the Dutch West India Company represented commercial capitalism at its most advanced. There's undoubtedly, this is undoubtedly true, that the Dutch were the premier commercial and financial organizers of large joint stock companies that were placed at the disposal of the Dutch investor class to globalize African slavery and to begin the colonization of Southeast Asia. In summary then, 
what we are looking at is a history so brutal, a history so cruel, a history that cannot be set aside, a history that must be faced up to and engage. The purpose of this presentation, therefore, is to say to the Dutch people, you were there at the beginning of the globalization of African enslavement. Whereas the Portuguese and the Spanish and the New World, many of them had doubt about the morality of African enslavement. The Dutch had no doubt. You were the ones who broke down that doubt that might have existed among the Spanish colonizers. You were the ones who said, no, the future of the American economy must be built upon African enslavement, and we have the finance, we have the skills, we have the navigations, we have the commercial instruments, and we will provide the world with enslaved Africans. That is the Dutch legacy. That is the history that we are met to discuss and, and to debate. The Dutch, in removing all doubt that African enslavement was going to be the future of Western Europe, the Dutch having removed all doubt that finance and commercial capitalism would flourish by engaging the enslaved African as the product and linking the product to the finance. Amsterdam became the financial center of the Western world before London took possession of that status. It was Amsterdam and it was built upon slave trading, finance and colonization, and moving the African around the world as a species of property. This is the Dutch achievement and legacy. I believe that the Dutch as a small nation in this 21st century has a duty, has a responsibility to confront this history and move into an era of reparatory justice with, with integrity, to move into a period to provide leadership in the new moral economy and society that is emerging in the age of Black Lives Matters. And you, the Dutch, who were the, be, the, 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 the beginners, you, the Dutch, who were the first to set out this globalization of African enslavement. You have a duty. You have a responsibility now to create a 21st century world based on justice, based on freedom, based on morality, where you can engage with the descendants of those you have enslaved. You can engage with the descendants of those you have colonized to begin a new 21st century narrative about freedom, equality. Without that engagement, you would have moved from the discovery that doubt must be destroyed. And yes, you destroy doubt about the financial impact of slavery. You destroy doubt about that. And now you can destroy doubt also about this. Without reparatory justice, this 21st century is going to be as turbulent, as subversive as the centuries in the past. With reparatory justice, with the engagement with this history, we can create a higher destiny for humanity. We can provide for humanity in this 21st century a more efficient, effective, and moral order. The Dutch, you have the responsibility to provide leadership in this new 21st century world. You have a responsibility to provide leadership. And the same way you provided the leadership to globalize slavery, you can provide the leadership in this 21st century to uproot the legacy and to help us to create a more balanced and level world for all of humanity to engage in this, in this 21st century. Without this commitment, there will be duplicity. The world and the 21st century 
has become intolerant of duplicity. What it's calling for is truth, reconciliation, and freedom for all. Thank you. Een ontzettend uh, inspirerende Kitty Kotti lezing verzorgd door Sir Hilary Beckles. Um, wij hebben op dit moment ook een live verbinding met hem, als het goed is, vanuit Jamaica. Ik wil jullie nogmaals de kijkers thuis allemaal uitnodigen om vragen uh, te versturen, vragen uh, op te schrijven via de Zoom-link. Um, Sir Hilary Beckles, uh, it's an honor to uh, do this Q&A with you and thank you so very much for this uh, Kitty Kotti lecture. We do have, um, the audience had the opportunity to ask some questions via Zoom. I don't know if we have a connection already. <laughs> yes, Sir Hilary Beckles? Yes, yes, yes. we do. All right. Um, yeah, so the audience had the opportunity to ask some questions. And um, in regards to your lecture, the first one is of Elton Martina. Um, it says, did the Netherlands give a response to the suit by the 15 CARICOM countries in 2013 regarding the 10-point plan for reparations in regards to the transatlantic slavery? Well, I can share with you that uh, the CARICOM Reparations Commission, uh, working on behalf of the governments of the Caribbean, uh, did reach out to the Dutch government seeking an audience uh, and a discussion uh, so as to begin the process of speaking about how best to approach reparatory justice in the context of slavery, slave trading and colonization. The position of the Dutch government, like the position of many other European governments, has not been supportive, but have merely recognized that there is a problem, but the way in which to resolve this matter is not within the context of reparatory justice. So uh, we do not share the implication of that response. And it is our intention to reach out to the Dutch government once again, as we intend to reach out to all of the governments of Europe once again. We believe that there should be a summit. We believe that there should be a global conference to discuss these matters in an orderly fashion. Thank you. And the next question is, um, why do you think, while it was several years ago already, that in the Netherlands we seem to have overlooked or not know about these international developments surrounding reparations? Well, there, there is no doubt that the matter of discussing the crimes against humanity that were a part of the slave trade, slavery and colonization, and the tremendous harm that has been done not only to African people uh, in Africa, but in the Caribbean and the Americas, that in the countries of Europe, uh, the, the media have not been very keen to support conversations. They have not been very keen to present information uh, uh, to the public in much the same way that the ministries of the education have not been keen to locate this history within the curriculum of schools. So there is in general, the continuation of a silence that silence begins with the silencing of the children and the teachers in the classroom. It also con concerns the silencing of the public uh, by the support of the media 
not to engage with the history and the consequences of this past. So yes, there continues to be uh, public and academic and intellectual silence around the significance of these matters. And hence, when you call for an organized professional scientific conversation, the public is unable to have that conversation because the public does not have access to the relevant information. Thank you. Um, the next question is of uh, Hortensia Felter. She asks, how do you see the development of the reparations movement and discourse on an international level? Well, it is my view, and I have made this point uh, over uh, uh, the last 20 years since, since it was made at the United Nations Conference uh, on Racism and Durban, South Africa in 2001. That was an intergovernmental conference uh, hosted by the United Nations. And in that conference, I, I made the statement that the reparatory justice movement is going to be the greatest global political movement of the 21st century. At the time, many people thought it might have been uh, an extreme statement to make. But in the last 20 years, what we have seen is precisely the unfolding of this position. Everywhere in the world, in all the continents, conversations, legislation, uh, public policy are being shaped around the need to promote reparatory justice because slavery was a global institution. All of the continents found themselves participating in the enslavement of the African peoples. It was the world's first global movement. African peoples were shipped all over the world to be enslaved. The racism against the African people was a global process. As a result of this, it follows logically, scientifically, that reparatory justice will also be a global movement because all of the continents, all of the countries that have been touched by this crime are calling for reconciliation and, and healing. So yes, this 21st century is going to be the century of reparatory justice. And no surprises there, remember what happened. It took all of the 19th century to uproot slavery. It took 100 years in the 19th century, beginning with 80, in 1804 through to the Spanish, the Spanish government and the Portuguese government that abolished slavery in Cuba and Puerto Rico and, and Brazil. It took a hundred years to get rid of slavery. Then it took, it took all of the 20th century to convert the, the, the civil rights of emancipation into human rights, democracy, justice. And now we are at the 21st century. And this is the final phase, reparatory justice for the crimes that have been committed. And the people of the world are not going to give up. They're not going to relinquish. They're not going to walk away until they receive this justice. Thank you. I see we have more questions coming in, so I probably need to select a couple of them. Um, I hope we can um, get answers to as many of them. But one question, it's quite elaborate, uh, from Petra. She says, at this moment, a team of white archaeologists from the Netherlands, UK and the US are busy excavating the remains of enslaved and free Africans of the 18th century burial ground in Stasia, the Dutch Caribbean. The excavations are carried out in a disrespectful manner and there, are, there is also no involvement and input from archeologists and scientists from the African diaspora. The reason why the archeological research is being conducted is very questionable. We suspect the government is trying to stimulate heritage to tourism to the island. Transparency is lacking from the local government as well as from the research team. The islanders have no idea what is going to happen to the remains of their forefathers. 
What do you think of these happenings in relation to reparatory justice? And how can we connect to the broader Caribbean community for support in our actions? Well, remember that uh, these countries that uh, the, the Dutch people and all of the other Europeans who enslaved the Africans and, and kept them in a state of slavery for centuries, the fundamental feature of that was the, the, the denial of African people of their human identity. And this is what the Dutch did. The Dutch and other European nations legislated that African peoples were not humans. They were not human beings, they were just property. They were real estate, they were chattel, they were like any other form of property. And what are the values of property? Well, you can buy it, you can sell it, you can mortgage it, you can lease it, you can use it as currency, you can go to the bank and use it as collateral. We were just humans, Africans were just property. The result of that is that they were treated that way and so they were, they were buried in shallow graves many of them not buried in graves at all. So when they die, when they die, they were just thrown into the ground without any form of dignity. And so all across the Caribbean, millions of African peoples were buried as were like animals, without proper ceremony, without uh, markations. Uh, here, here on my campus in Jamaica, just, 200 yards away from where I am, we were uh, preparing to build a medical faculty building uh, 10 years ago. And when the, con the contractors came on the site and the bulldozers came to, to begin to prepare the foundation for the building, what began to happen? Hundreds of skeletons and bones began to come up from the ground right here on the middle of our campus. And we didn't know that what was there was a shallow, a shallow grave where African bodies were thrown to the ground. We didn't know that. And we are here in the middle of a university campus. And we didn't know that we were hosts to these skeletons, these, these unmarked bodies and unmarked graves. So yes, we are aware that in the Dutch Antilles, this excavation is taking place and that the local community is separated from engagement control of that project because it is about power. The Dutch government has made it very clear that this is a scene that is not to be used for the purposes of the celebration of black life but it could be used as a cultural site for tourism. We have the same problem in the British Virgin Islands. Uh, there is a site which has been excavated in the British Virgin Islands and the reactions of the British government are the same as the Dutch government. So it is because the Caribbean is still a colonized place. It is the only part of the world where there are still colonies, where the Dutch and the British and the French are keeping people in colonial bondage. And this kind of expression about history and archaeology, uh, it is about power, where the European governments expose the local people in the Caribbean to the intellectual brutality of power. So we find it quite disgraceful, and we are of the view that this attitude today by the Dutch government is consistent with the attitude the Dutch government held towards black people from the beginning of slavery to this particular moment in history. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Sir Hilary Beckles. We already come to an end of this Q&A, unfortunately. Um, yeah, I, want, I really want to thank you for um, giving us the Kitty Koti lecture. And I want to thank the audience as well. As well. Um, ik wil jullie allemaal bedanken namens het Ninsei en Pakhuis De Zwijger voor het kijken naar deze Kitty Koti lezing. De opname van vanavond zal op YouTube terug te zien zijn, evenals de andere evenementen die uh, in het kader van Kitty Koti hebben plaatsgevonden in Pakhuis De Zwijger. 
Dit jaar zal um, er deels een online en een fysieke um, herdenking zijn, slavernijverleden. Morgen, het wordt morgen live uitgezonden door de NPO en AT5 vanaf 1 uur tot half 3. Het Kitty Kotti Festival zelf zal helaas geen doorgang vinden in verband met corona. Maar er zijn wel een aantal livestreams. Um, zoals die om 9 uur Kitty Kotti Kawina concert. Voor meer informatie kunt u kijken op de Facebook van Ninsei of op de website. En voor nu wens ik u een prettige avond toe en bedank ik u voor het kijken naar de Kitty Kotti lezing.